you. Hello. Hi. Um, my name is Julia Farrington. I'm the curator of Films for Transparency and uh, delighted to see you all here um, to watch this, this excellent film. And thank you, Roland, for bringing such a, a powerful, complicated story together in visual form. It's so, um, it's so good to see, be taken through that process um, in film form. Um, so we have a, a, very, a very fine panel here to discuss the film and the issues it raises. We'll talk for probably about 20, 25 minutes and then open to the floor. So please, there'll be plenty of time. We're in no hurry. We've got plenty of time for a rich debate. Um, and so please hold your questions for, for a little while. Um, in order for, to talk about this today, we've got Greta Fenner, who is the managing director of the Basel Institute on Governance and director of its International Center for Asset Recovery. We have uh, the Reverend David Ugolo, who's Executive Director of the Africa Network for Environment and Economic Justice and Vice Chairman of the United Nations Convention Against Corruption, UNCAC Coalition, an international civil society group championing the implementation of UN UNCAC globally. And Simon Taylor, who is Director and Co-Founder of Global Witness and leads on Global Witness's oil and corruption campaign launched in 1999. And then, of course, we have Roland Chauville, the uh, co-director and producer of the film. Um, I'm going to ask Roland just briefly to, to, to kick us off and to frame the conversation. Why did you decide to tell this particular story in film form? And how are you working with the film? Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, I'll use that one. Um, Thank you very much. Thank you again uh, to the audience for, for watching the movie and staying for the debate. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So the um, a movie, I live in Geneva, and uh, as you've seen, and uh, for me, I uh, had heard about this corruption uh, story, but that didn't make a scandal, because I was going to use scandal, but it definitely was not a scandal, because it barely made any head news, and I heard about it um, uh, randomly, really, st stumbling upon a... a Public Eye, so which is a Swiss NGO report. And I thought, well, this is something that should make the news. It doesn't, and uh, um, it's happening in my city, and I had no idea about it. So I wanted to, to tell that story and connect it to uh, this defender, Moke, from Congo that I knew. And I thought, well, my city, uh, there's someone in my city that's corrupting uh, the government of uh, Moke in Congo all the other way. Uh, to, uh, to Congo, and I have no idea about it, and um, how come my, someone in my city living a few blocks from me can have that impact on Moke's life? And so I thought, well, we need to know about it, and well, movies seemed like a, a natural, uh, because they had been, it had been documented, so movie was an opportunity to bring it to, uh, more to life, so I thought this was a good uh, way of doing that. And... Um, so the movie aired on Swiss TV. So the Swiss TV had, uh, produced this documentary, which is really good. We're really pleased by that because that uh, ensured that a lot of Swiss people saw it. Um, so it was aired last year, and now we are trying to, to work with civil society in Switzerland to uh, get the, the movie around, and there's been a few screenings in different cities. And we're hoping as well, and we'll talk about that in details, but hoping that uh, the main outcome, I think, of this movie is, well, there's two, really. It's the transparency of payments, making sure that governments are, when, uh, or companies, when they give payments to uh, governments, this is a bit more transparent. And the other thing is the créance compensatrice, uh, those uh, 90 million that the Genvor paid to the Swiss that's sitting on in Swiss banks. Uh, you all know that uh, Switzerland is doing pretty well economically, and it doesn't need those 90 million which represents the, the profit that Gunvor made through the corruption. So it was calculated with the former trader that cooperated with the justice system, and he said, well, this is about the money, the, the benefit we made in Congo thanks to this corruption. So the Swiss said, well, we're going to tax them this amount. And um, we believe this is probably, would we'll do better, a better job uh, supporting maybe or going back to the population of Congo and Côte d'Ivoire. So, that's something we, we're working on a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I'd just like to run down the, the panel and just have your, your reactions to the film and any particular comments you'd like to make on, on the film itself. Greta, would you like to start us off? 
Um, do I have two hours for all my reactions? <laughs> no, I mean, it's a powerful movie. Thank you so much for, for bringing it to us. It's, 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 it goes to show how little we know about <laughs> so much stuff still. And we've been at this for a couple of decades after all. So that is, uh, you know, even for someone who's worked in this field for a long, uh, this film is still revelatory. So that, that's, uh, that's uh, incredible. I think you also b found a very good balance of, of, uh, of listening to everyone, although some people we had to listen to did make me sort of angry, but you know, you gotta listen to them as well. Um, but also to bring that, that contrast between what's happening in a city like Geneva or you know, in many other places around the world, there are other trading centers and, and ultimately what it leads to in, in a country like Congo. You know, the point you just made about the 90 million profit is perhaps the thing that almost makes me the most angry because frankly speaking, 90 million in profit, that's not a lot of money. And if you see the consequences that it leads to in a country like Congo, then hearing, I think that woman from the regulatory authority, uh, from the you know, association saying, there is a balance between, should we just stop doing business in these countries um, because we can't do clean business? Well, the answer clearly is yes. You should stop doing business there because if the only profit you get out of it is 90 million, I honestly think it's absolutely crazy. I mean, that's just my very spontaneous gut reaction, and, and we can talk about a lot of other things. Yeah, gut reaction's great. And let's, can we have your gut reaction too, please, Reverend? Okay. Thank you, Roland. This is really very helpful. Again, you know, just telling the story through the victim was powerful. It, was, um, it provides people to understand the issues. And I'm very happy that you were able to um, narrate the story through a brick, a very good friend of mine, and, and, and this colleague who unfortunately has passed on. Uh, may he so rest in perfect peace. You know, there are a number of them that is dying every day. I come from a region in Nigeria, the Niger Delta region, as we speak, and people are dying. <coughs> Obviously because of these activities that are going on, this corruption. And so I'm very confident that this kind of story put life to what we are saying. Uh, it, it put it more um, possible for people to appreciate how it works. Because when you talk about corruption, it's, it's still a very difficult, complex thing for people to understand. But the way you have done it with, through this film, people can understand what we mean by corruption and who is benefiting, and who are the people that are the enabler, and who are the people that are providing opportunity for this to continue to thrive. And, and I hope that with this film, a lot of things will happen. Thank you. Same questions. Same questions. Um, Gosh, at, at risk of being repetitive, and sorry for that, um, I would say this is the best film I've ever seen that captures the essence of exactly what you just said. That, and especially around the oil traders or the trading houses in general, they, uh, and, and I'm, I place them on a rung below the, the, the industry space that I'm normally working on, which is the more normal oil companies, who, and that makes it pretty low because they're not exactly in the stratosphere of good behavior. So, so I, I found the film both shocking and moving because I know a lot of the characters <laughs> on the film, and including Moke, obviously, and that's awful to see that. Um, it really captures the consequence, and I just thought you did that brilliantly, so thank you for that. Um, and maybe a last reflection just as an opening round, because there's lots of elements of this, but just this, this whole issue of being involved in, in provision of more debt financing, this pre-financing stuff. We've been talking about this for 20, more than 20 years, not, not involving traders, but later involving traders, absolutely, for many years now. But we started talking about pre-financing from banks, usually centered in London. Uh, and it's kind of like an oil mortgaging process. You flog off your assets in the future on the basis that you know it's for X, Y, and Z, but actually, is it? And the reality, let's just be straight here. If you do this as an entity in a country with a violent kleptocracy in charge, 
why would you be surprised if the money doesn't go anywhere other than into the pockets and assets of the people in charge? Well, let's just be clear here. So what we're really talking here is a loan shark business. And the people who, who end up with the nasty people coming round and basically dumping on them are the citizens of the country who end up with the debt. And I would suggest as an action point before we even get going is if you're a business, a bank, or a trader, or anyone else for that matter, and you lend money in a place like this to people for whom there is no accountability whatsoever and they kill people in the way and they park their assets in multiple pro uh, properties in places like Paris and other nice sexy places to go shopping at the expense of their citizens, the citizens should not be on, in hock to those lending institutions or companies. This is odious debt, this is deliberate, deliberate debt and you should go down the hole for the losses you made. So I'll just open up with that, thank you. Okay, so thank you for those reactions. Um, Roland, there are two particular issues that you wanted to sort of focus on, um, which was about the transparency of payments and um, redistribution. So can we start with transparency and just take comments and just, just butt in and, and, and have a conversation amongst yourselves? Sounds good, thanks for your, for your reactions and your, your nice words. Uh, just maybe a couple of things on that, yeah. The, the role of banks, I think it's, uh, it's problematic in Switzerland because the, the Swiss authorities are saying we're regulating banks so there's no need to regulate those trading companies. But then they open lines of credit to companies and those trading companies can spend it the way they want. And then they loan the money and then it turns into a loan shark uh, business, which you, yeah, that's really the right word. So yeah, just asking banks, I mean, there's actually a really good example of how banks can do their job. We've seen in the movie when the uh, Credit Suisse uh, was, um, well, they con uh, contacted the Swiss authorities saying, look, there's a, there's a weird transfer from Switzerland to China. So they did their job when they do that, but uh, we also see them, they're trading oil with uh, Congo, which is, I mean, it's not obviously illegal, but it's certainly strange. And yeah, uh, we've seen that they, they lend money. And actually some banks have decided to get out of uh, loaning money to, uh, to trading because it's too, it's too um, <clears throat> problematic. But yeah, on the uh, transparency of payments, um, well, we have Simon here who's part of ETI. We had Boris Makusso as well, uh, who is part of ETI, so the International Transparency uh, Initiative, something? <laughs> Extractive, yeah. So EITI, so this is, a, uh, I think Gunvor wasn't part of it before he got uh, uh, convicted, then it joined it, and then it became, I think, one of the, yeah, it just became it. And so a lot of companies, they say, oh, it's not possible to publish about what we give to governments and so on, and then one starts doing it, and then the others keep saying it's not possible, and then, and then another one does it, and then they realize actually it was possible and it wasn't killing the business. And they said extract, extractions, extractive industries, uh, it's one of the, uh, and you had saying it at the end, they, um, at the beginning, they, they weren't really transparent, and then they caught up with reality, and then the trading sector is still lagging behind. But it was possible in the extractive industries, and, and it's basically uh, happening uh, slowly, but then the, the traders are still off the hook. And in, <clears throat> as we say in the movie as well, a year ago, a couple of years ago now, there was a new law in Switzerland where uh, transparency was uh, pushed for extractive industries, but that's only four companies based in Switzerland, whereas the trading companies, it's 400 of them. And Switzerland says, in the law it says, uh, it could be, this law could be applied to trading companies if the inter in accordance with the international community. So <clears throat> basically Switzerland is waiting for the international community, and this is the role you can play here putting pressure on Switzerland. Uh, I mean, Switzerland usually is looking up to the EU and say, okay, if the EU is doing something, then we're just gonna be on the same level, but we don't wanna be the first because who wants to be the first? So, um, so it's there, it's uh, obviously, it's a question that everyone's talking about transparency, but Switzerland is definitely trying to not be the first and waiting for the others to, to act on that. So it's a very, yeah, very Swiss. I mean, being Swiss, I, 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 I can confirm that's a, a bit of a Swiss thing. I think also, you know, the drama that we see in this movie is not a drama that people live every day in Switzerland. And, you know, most people just go about their work and they don't actually reflect. And I can, you know, I'm not blaming anyone. They don't quite reflect 
on the fact that much of our wealth, not all of it, you know, much of the wealth is also because, you know, maybe probably very laborious people and so on and so forth. But, you know, some of the foundation of Switzerland's wealth is on the back of people, like in many other countries in the north, on the back of people who did never do anything wrong other than being born in the wrong place. So I think, you know, the public pressure is still way too low in Switzerland, absolutely. And um, I hope that this movie and other movies will, will, will contribute. It's true that Switzerland likes to go with the, with, you know, with the majority. We don't like to stand out all too much, especially not if it could have a potentially negative impact. And, and, and I do think the question, I'm not saying that in order to sort of defend the attitude of Switzerland, but the, the, the challenge that we have if we are strong on regulation, these countries can, uh, these companies within a matter of a few days, frankly speaking, they can move to another jurisdiction. It's not a large manufacturing industry where you have huge you know, uh, enterprises to move. There are a bunch of people sitting in an office and they work through their computers. You can move them to another jurisdiction. Do we want that? Probably not ideal either because they're definitely not going to go into a country which is any more interested in regulating them. So I do think as a dilemma we have to address and I think the whole week has been about dilemmas to be honest. So I do think we gotta really be careful because intuitively, I want to push very radically for very strong regulation, and, and you know, I can get extremely angry about these things. On the other hand, I do also see, and we see that with, actually we see that with a lot of criminals, so in our practice for asset recovery, you know, we see a diversification strategy nowadays. The guys don't just put their money, actually they don't really put a lot of money into Switzerland anymore because we have guys like Yves Berdosa, and they know we do have that. They may leave a piece of it in Switzerland because it's still a very good financial center. But the cases we're investigating, you know, they spread their risk across multiple jurisdictions and increasingly they're going away from the countries like Switzerland where we do at least get some cooperation. So mm. it's really something we need to keep an eye on. So it does need to be an international collective action in a way but you'll always only get the good guys to join it, I guess, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you write really, and I completely agree with Greta, that we needed international uh, collective actions around um, raising this issue, otherwise they easily can move from one jurisdiction to another. But what is really important is building people's powers around this movement, and the victim also playing a very major role to hold these companies accountable. Because obviously, um, with this kind of theme, it raises the consciousness. And um, you will also agree that if not this Ukraine war, um, the even going after the kleptocrats has never been the issue. So it takes a crisis to spur people to take decision. So what kind of crisis are we looking for that could mm. help um, energize this kind of actions that we think we're looking for? That's something we must look into. So we don't need any chaos for it to happen, but we can be strategic. And, and, and I think the way to go is about raising an awareness, building consciousness, and linking up a kind of a framework that connects the victims with the North. And that kind of movement can really help. Now, the issue whether um, Switzerland can take the action again, because certainly the company can easily move to other jurisdiction where the regulation is a bit weak, that's a key issue we must look into. So in looking for a kind of a, a, an international framework that will look to make it impossible for company to easily move around, then we have to also hold on the actors, the key actors. They are, need to be held responsible because those companies don't exist alone. Individuals run those companies. How do we hold them accountable? It's very important. What kind of tools that are available? We must continue to look into those tools and continue to look at the track record of these individuals and where the goals and the benefits that accrue to them. Those are several things that I think we should also be looking into. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Same difference. We'll, we'll end up with the wall at the end. Sorry. Um, I, I, I actually agree with both of what you both said. Um, <clears throat> but as a practitioner of long-term efforts to get, uh, how can I put it, rules in place on an international stage so you do level the playing field, don't just chase um, people somewhere else, it's kind of a process of banging your head against a concrete post. 
just to flag that. And that's even with the benefits of having a massive coalition. I'm thinking here of the Publish What You Pay coalition, which I was the co-founder of 20 years ago. And it has taken us 20 years to get to the place we are now, both within institutions like the EITI and also externally in the world of mandatory disclosure reporting. Uh, and what started as a, um, an ask, a, a demand actually for a legal framework that would force oil, gas and mining companies to disclose their payments has now metamorphosized into things like contract transparency, disclosure of beneficial owners, all of these other things which were always on the cards but just took a long time to gain the political space within which to move them. And uh, I, I, just, I, I just put that up because it's a long fight. Change doesn't come quickly. But I also think some of the stuff we're talking about in your film has been around for a while and we have been talking about it for a long time. So on the one hand, I'm pleased that traders have joined EITI, for example. If they can join EITI, then we can also, I think, legitimately assume they're pro-transparency, because that's why they've joined EITI. And if they're not pro-transparency, they should leave, is my view. Get out. So if they're part of EITI, then they should be lobbying the Swiss government to put their own rules in place. So let's call on them to do that, because there can't be an EITI which is a pro-transparency institution and lobby against those laws. So that's one thing we could try. Just by reminder of, you, you internationalized it. It might be interesting just to extend that. Uh, I was just checking this morning some of the stuff we've talked about. We've talked about traders on and off uh, around Congo, Brazzaville and other places for quite some time. But I was reading something this morning which I thought was quite sort of prescient and talks about what's going on in Europe right now. Um, one of the stats we picked up earlier this year was in March. At the end of March, we published something which uh, suggests that, um, uh, hang on, what is it? Of, uh, three of these companies, Vitol, Traficura, Glencore, and Gunvor, which were Vitol, Traficura, and Glencore, traded more oil with Russia in March this year, so right after the invasion of Ukraine, than in the previous three years. Suggest to me they knew exactly this was a problematic trade and they were going to get as much as they could. So I, I think that's really interesting because in, in initiatives like EITI, you spend a lot of time talking to people on, a, on an equal basis or seeking to, and they present themselves as these good, credible players. And indeed, some of their actors in these institutions are indeed are. I have no problem with them as personal, as individuals. However, their institutions they represent are not their behavior is reprehensible. And I think we really have to put that up there as the benchmark by which we judge their action. You know, they're not the innocent players. They do things. If you, I've concluded a long time ago, if you don't nail it down, they steal it. So we're really talking about very often criminal enterprise type activities. So that's really the beast we're dealing with here. Um, and I think we'd be well advised to remember that in the context of trying to drive policy because they will fight it. Yeah, I think just on individual behaviors. Uh, Switzerland uh, recently, uh, last year, uh, convicted Benny Steinmetz for corruption in, uh, in Guinea. Uh, so he's a, he's a trader, but he was for buying, uh, for yeah, getting for very cheap through corruption uh, the license for a mine in Guinea, and then he was corrupted. He was convicted by the prosecutor, you see, he, Yves Bertossa, and then he's appealing at the moment. He changed lawyers, and uh, so he's hoping for, a, well, he is on. Uh, it's an appeal, so he's hoping for a different outcome this time. But this was kind of the first time that Switzerland went after um, individuals, and that's, yeah, thanks to some prosecutor. If Bertosa is based in Geneva, there's a, you know, he has some freedom to do that. His father was a prosecutor, very famous in the 90s. And, um, it, but it's down to individuals, which is, uh, yeah, a bit sad, but yeah, it's left to that. But it's at least something, some trend in Switzerland where uh, they, they, they think it's not um, impossible anymore to go after individuals. And uh, the gun war uh, the, the, is, at the moment, under investigation by Switzerland for other, another case in Ecuador. And they had the former trader of gun war, uh, that was corrupting in Ecuador was convicted by the U.S. justice system. So when that happened, the U.S. conviction, then Switzerland opened the investigation, so it's still happening. So um, obviously, and that was happening in the year 2010s, at this, kind of at the same time as Congo. 
So um, you can't really say anymore that the CEO of uh, Gunvor didn't know. I mean, it's really, it's the hard, that line is getting harder and harder to defend. Uh, so it's, yeah, I, I, eventually, and that's what I got from public guy saying, is, that where, is where do you stop in the going up the line of command and, the, and it's a political decision where you stop in a way because yeah, you get, you're starting to really gather enough information to know well if there wasn't anything in place for so long, well some people knew about it, not just the traders really. Great, I'd like to move on to the, the question of redis redistribution. Um, Reverend, would you like to come in on that one first? It's okay, um, first uh, I think there's another issue that will easily come up whenever the discussions around um, the benefit that will go to the victim. How will it be distributed? Who is the victim? All those questions will come up. And I think the first thing is that the victim deserves to be compensated. And um, the issue of transparency will certainly come up. And then the issue of the credibility of the government. Um, that will um, eventually help to utilize the resources. But in countries where you have a very corrupt government, a, 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 an alternative options can also be adopted for the compensation to go to the people and to ensure. And the reason why this has to happen is because it helps again to end the culture of impunity. It sends a strong message that, look, this way of conducting business is unacceptable. And the people who are direct victim of this kind of business need to have a benefit when those companies are fine. But if you, like the report from Star that say, left behind the bargain, when all these bargain and negotiations are going on and you don't carry the victim along, it is not a good way, it's not a fair way to put the issues on the global agenda. <coughs> and I'm happy that there are already cases of that, the Glencoe case for instance now. And I'm aware now that the, um, some compensation is going to Congo. And um, um, although Nigerian government filed for victim and it was thrown out, uh, that's not the end of the game. It provides an opportunity for us to continue the conversation. But all it us, what this has shown clearly is that, and in less than six months or three months, Glencoe has gone to Congo now to compensate the Congo people. What I don't know whether there was investigation in Congo, at what point, and what kind of criteria, and how do they arrive at this amount of money that is going to Congo? Is it just at Glencoe discretion? That's where we now, as civil society, we need to begin to ask questions. There need to be a framework. How does company, for example, a company makes about $1 billion. Like one of our panelists have also said here, yeah, the damage, and this is greater, the damage that is done to the people and the environment is beyond, you can't describe it. For example, in the case of Nigeria, those officials that are involved in the bribery that are continue to still remain in NNPC, they are powerful, politically exposed individuals. And the role they play in Nigerian politics, as we're approaching election next year, they will decide who will win the election. So you can't have democracy to function properly. And so you can imagine what that means. So countries where this happen, there is a correlation with underdevelopment and corruption. And Nigeria is a classical case. And in countries where these kind of grand corruptions are going on, you will never have a group. And the boomerang effect is that there will be a lot of migration. And that's why you, if you open your backyard, you always find a Nigerian because they are moving out of the country. Because the level, there's the latest MBS report now have shown that 133 million Nigerians are poor, and and is increasing every day. So are there evidence that if this compensation comes, it will be beneficial? Yes. In the Abasha through, over 325.5 million dollars was returned back to Nigeria. We are the one monitoring it. We have seen how 5,000 Naira is very helpful to the common people in the village. And the first time in history, Nigerian poor people benefited from the return of stolen money from Switzerland to the poor people of Nigeria. And over 1.9 million poor Nigerians have benefited from that distribution. So which is that? 
returning compensation to the people can be very helpful. It sends a, a really good message. It raises consciousness in the people that corruption must not pay, crime must not pay. At the same time, it builds a constituency around this conversation. Because each time we are discussing this whole issue, the issue of victims is not faceless. This conversation is not faceless. There are people, there are constituency, they probably will not have the opportunity to have come to Washington to attend this meeting. Mm -hmm. But they are there. Mm -hmm. And that's where this film is very helpful. To say that the victim of this whole process, they deserve to be compensated. And how do we bring their voice to be in the negotiation table? So that to avoid what Glencoe have just done with Congo now. That is not a good way to do things. They just decided, and then if you look, the clauses around it is that to preempt for that um, lawsuit and to avoid for that conversation. You know, that's very pro uh, pre preemptive. We should first and foremost do analysis to say the corruption that has taken place in, with Glencoe bribery in Congo, what is the consequence? Mm. In the case of South Sudan, you, you know how damaging that was to Sudan. And then in Nigeria, those guys now that are in NNPC, they will decide who will win the election next year. Because they obviously will buy the electoral process over. And, and the, 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 the painful aspect of it all is that nobody knows them. This is the real danger. And this is not a, a this, we shouldn't allow this to continue. This kind of justice is not acceptable. What is fair to the UK people is should be fair to the Nigerian people. If corruption is not good in UK, then it should not also be good in Nigeria. A situation where the US government, the UK government, undertake a negotiation, a plea bargain with company, and allow those who are complicit in the bribe taking to be covered, it's not a good way to go. I mean, I can, I can add to that, though I can't do it as well as David um, can. Uh, but I think we need to also unpack it a little bit, because so far, if you look at the international legal framework, the only money that countries are theoretically really obliged to give back to the country is stolen public money. So if someone like kind of grabs money or you know, takes money out of the coffers or gets, gets a bribery because he's a public official, you know, that's the only money that at the moment in, on international law has to go back. And I can tell you there are numerous countries who aren't actually compliant even with that not in law uh, and certainly not in practice. We have the big cases are the foreign bribery cases, these kinds of cases. They're either, and, and they're settled, and then we also have the money laundering cases where corruption may be one of the predicate defenses. And under the international legal framework, there is still no obligation to have any of that money go back. What, so first of all, we need to sort that out. Really, really need to change practices and laws because I, I said that on, I can't remember when my panel was on Tuesday or so, it's like, it is mind boggling for me that a country takes Switzerland, the UK, whatever. I mean, thank, thank God they are convicting these companies for foreign bribery. That's, that's a good start. In Switzerland, it's really only Yves Bertosa. Let's be very honest, he's a totally lonely fighter. He has barely any resources. But nonetheless, that's a good thing. But how can the money then stay in Switzerland? How can Switzerland be the one to profit from the fact that their company has bribed over there? It like makes, even there, it makes no sense. And the third point I want to make, I've got a million others, and I'm coming back to these 90 million. So we usually have a fine. And then we come to the disgorgement of profit, which is these 90 million. And that's it. They're still not paying for the damage. If we leave it at the fine and the disgorgement of profit, it's an easy win because, oh, well, let's give it a try. At the worst case, we won't make the profit out of it. That's about the worst that can happen. No damage to the company and no compensation for the damage they caused. And the compensation for the damage that they caused should be at least 10, if not 20 times the profit that they have made. And that's probably only still a tip of the iceberg of the harm that was done to that country. Now, I leave it to the brilliant mind of, of uh, David and Simon to figure out how to quantify the damage, because that, I think, is ultimately the crux of the question. Smart one, eh? <laughs> I love your 10 to 20 times. That's a good start. Um, my colleague Patrick, who was just in here a moment ago, I think he's just yeah. gone out, um, he, he, he uh, had a chat with a, um, a finance expert, and um, 
that person said to him, well, you know what, until we get into the space where it costs you 20% of the value of your company, it is not going to have any impact. I would add one other thing, just to be quick, because we're going to go on to questions, um, which is until we start putting bosses in jail, this is not going to change. I, I agree with your point, it's like down to individuals, but it is individuals who make these decisions. And all this rubbish about we've got internal checks and balances. The internal checks and balances systems, in my experience, are basically there to tick a box to get you out of the slammer, or even worse, the cost of doing business fine, because you can say you had internal checks and, oh, it's so, so sorry, we didn't notice it. Even though the very same individuals were intimately involved in negotiating the deal. So we need to put, I hate saying this because I'm not really a person who likes, you know, law and order type discussions and putting people in jail. But I actually think the, the consequences of this, as you've really illustrated, and your film brilliantly captures, is death by a thousand cuts for many people. And when, when you see mass migration, you know, people don't walk across the Sahara and risk their lives floating across the Mediterranean and what have you just because they feel like having a little holiday in the sun in Europe to, you know, as an economic migrant to earn lots of money. They're doing this because they're leaving countries where they can't function anymore, right? Why is that? Well, corruption where it bleeds countries dry, and many of the countries we're talking about, that is exactly the situation we're talking about, is one of the main reasons. So, in my view, if we really want proper development to happen, where we have equity in in income and ability to live, we have to deal with this problem. And if that means putting some bosses in jail to send a serious signal, then that's what it needs. So I, I really welcome moves to change policies so that becomes a, a more achievable thing. By the way, um, in terms of putting bosses in jail, our panel, this is a plug so people can't leave today, at 2.30 we'll be talking more about that. Thank you. I'm gonna move on to questions now. There's a question here and We'll start here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Geneva-based, exile-based investigative journalist. I'm living in Switzerland the last seven years and I continue to work on the same kind of activities as like your colleagues on Azerbaijan, on Caspian region, on Turkmenistan and Kazakhstan. And thanks for a very good movie. Very appreciate where you make it and it's a clear example. You should continue to Make, you can make like many episodes related with Sokar, which is Sokar. also based in Switzerland, in Geneva, and which is in cooperation with Migros. Like they're doing many dirty things, which is we are always blame them. Unfortunately, I'm, my question is, how did you able to prepare this movie? Because it needs finance. Who sponsored this? Because I'm asked like even Swiss-based donors for guys and especially Swiss MFA for, could you give us funds, because we always have a lack of funding to investigate such a kind of corruption, and they denied to support this kind of initiative. We want to do exactly the same thing on Sokar trading, because Sokar trading, right now you, Gunvar, because it's Russian's company, Timchenko, Putin is now trends, all, people, all world fight, fight with the Putin, but unfortunately, guys like uh, from Sokar Trading, they now doing the same thing. They are still now, right now, help to Putin to cross this sanction. They are mixing oil in the Mediterranean Sea, mm -hmm. from conflict zone from North Africa, from Syria, from Iraq. And they are doing this, Alif doing this with Erdogan. But that's these guys, these guys are some kind of help to Ukraine. They are still handshakeable from the Western community. And how you, it's possible to continue such as effort in Switzerland, and not only in Switzerland, in whole Europe, because, yeah, it's a good movie, but unfortunately, yeah, you, and second question, what do you think? Because you say for now, s some uh, kind of positive feedbacks, it's people's stolen assets going directly to poor people. But do you think it's the best way, because now Switzerland doing the same thing with Uzbekistan, they are returning money, which is Swiss court, decide for the stolen assets, back to uh, the daughter of previous dictator, punished by new dictator. And Switzerland gives this 200 million, a Swiss franc, back to corrupt, another corrupted government, but Uzbek, like anti-corruptional fighters, 
and most of them in exile, staying without assets to continue this investigation. Do you think it's fair? I think it's best investment to support Uzbek civil society, which is working on anti-corruption efforts, and don't give this money back to dictators. Thank you. My name is Faisal Anwar, and I'm from uh, Pakistan, and I divide my time between Canada and Pakistan. As an independent consultant, I'm a former banker. Um, my question is uh, beyond uh, the compensation or the damages that can be paid to the victims. Uh, like in the UK, I think there is uh, what, what they call the senior management responsibility, the SMR law, according to which the CEO and the top executives of a company, if they are in violation of certain you know, compliance regulations, including the money laundering regulations, <laughs> Uh, you know, there can be a case for personal liability of these officers. So do you have something in Switzerland or, or is this something that can be uh, pushed for so that it's not just the fines and the penalties and the damages that are paid by these companies? Because frankly, these, these amounts, e even if they are large, and I've seen that in the case of banks at least, uh, but, you know, they are not dissuasive, mm -hmm. okay? And um, the banks continue to violate the regulations. Thank you. So, thank you. Take one more here. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Bonnie Polifka. I'm a research professor at Tecnológico de Monterrey in Mexico. I have two questions. First, um, this case, the sentence was handed down in 2019 for acts that took place in 2008 and 2011. That seems pretty common for multinational cases like this. And my question, first question, uh, what was happening in the other years? And where's the accountability for those other years? You know, be between 2011 and 2019, for example, was the company, I find it very difficult to believe that the company wasn't paying annual or semi-annual bribes in a case like this. And then my second question is, you know, before we get to 2019 and applying sanctions and, and possible retribution to the victims, what can or should multinational firms do to either share their profits with the local communities or to pressure governments to actually use their profits to develop the local communities? Thank you. Yeah, and then we'll do a second round. Yeah, go, go ahead. Okay, yeah. great. Uh, thank you so much for a very fascinating panel and, and fantastic documentary. I'm Helen Taylor from Spotlight on Corruption um, from the UK, following the Glencore case there. And perhaps just to start on uh, an observation, I was really taken um, by, or struck rather, by the uh, talk of reputational risk. Um, a sort of a, a management, you know, which, which really kind of relates to the sort of softly, softly approach to regulation, that we don't want to sort of scare people off. Um, and I really think, having seen what happens in the UK with, with a fairly significant fine of 280 million in financial penalties, um, of Glencore at least, mm -hmm. um, we eagerly wait the prosecution of senior executives. But um, perhaps in somewhat in disagreement with, with the, my Pakistani colleague here, um, Glencore prosecution is the first corporate conviction under Section 1 of the Bribery Act, um, the UK Bribery Act, which means it's the first time that a company has pled guilty to senior executives having been involved and having backed and approved the bribery scheme. So it's really extraordinary and a first. Um, and, you know, I think we need legal reform there. So the first is I think senior executives have to be held to account. That's the way to counter the sort of softly approach to reputational risk. Um, but a couple of questions. The, the, the one on intermediaries, which I think was covered so well in the film, um, here we, you know, at best the UK won't prosecute the agents in, in the Glencore case and, and in these kinds of cases. So I think, you know, we want to push for the accountability of local public officials who, who, who accepted bribes, as David's pointed out, and we want senior executives to be held to account. But what about the intermediaries? How can we target them in terms of accountability, given the key role they play? And then the other is on, on the enablers. Um, in terms of, of accountability there, where effectively, as I understand it, and came across very powerfully in the film, that that due diligence is outsourced to banks and financial institutions. And I think we need to, 
if they do have responsibilities, we need to look at um, hard-edged accountability for what they are required to do legally. Um, yeah, thank you. I can take a couple of these points, perhaps. I can start with the last one, and that is indeed a problem, the outsourcing of the due diligence to banks, not only because we know that they haven't always traditionally been doing a good job, let's be honest, and I'm not, you know, I don't want to be in their shoes and having to do the job, but we know that. The problem is also, at least in the case of Switzerland, and I would say in many other countries, the regulatory framework, oh, the, the, the investigative powers, then the, the, the money laundering and reporting office is heavily undersourced. So, you know, you outsource responsibility for a hugely high-risk sector to the banks. It's already one step removed, so due diligence is a lot more difficult. And then actually those who are, you know, sifting through all these reports, certainly in Switzerland, are heavily under-resourced. Under so that's one problem. On top of that, sanctions that can be put on banks have traditionally been very mild in Switzerland. We've had exactly one bank, I think, that went out of business because, that, because of that. So, you know, it's... In theory, it could potentially work if, if then the money laundering enforcement was really strong. Um, I think the other one that I also just uh, was thinking about is, I still want to get back to this point, and, and whatever you said, uh, drop that, is we need to find a way for these companies to be forced to act collectively, not to do business there anymore. And I, I thought of that, you know, in terms of leadership. So I think that that's really critical. But I think the last one is also, uh, again, resourcing. I mean, if a country like Switzerland, the UK and others, they, we, we don't even remotely have the, the enough resources. You know, we just heard how many other cases, how many films could you be making? How many more cases could we be prosecuting? And there needs to be like a relationship between the risk of our economies and our businesses with the resources that we give to the prosecution service. And that, I can tell you, is there is no balance there. Um, okay, just really quick. Um, I totally agree with going after SOCAR. We spent some time <laughs> investigating them. Highly problematic. Um, uh, as for what you were just saying, I. I, I, I totally agree with the asymmetry of resources. There just is no, no comparison. I take your point. What was the figure you said? 280 million? 280 million pounds. Eight pounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I would juxtapose that against Ivan Glesenberg's net wealth, which I just looked up, was allegedly $9.1 billion, right? It, for me, that's just the cost of doing business. We, we sat with him on two occasions and talked to him and told him, which I simply don't believe he didn't know in intimate detail, it's not credible, about his operations with Dan Gertler in the Congo. And let's face it, we're not even having prosecutions about their operations with Dan Gertler in the Congo, which were huge. And frankly, that's what I, I mean, to be fair, I have to look at all the uh, documentation and so on to make a more informed position on this, but it's, it's been a, a matter of first glance amusement to me that, that the DRC wasn't one of the countries where they were being prosecuted for in the United States and the UK because it was such a scandal and it was such a bad scandal that Gertler gets sanctioned by the US and others and if it's good enough to sanction him uh, and we know because of our own investigation, there's a lot of material evidence out there. What on earth is Glen, uh, Glencore not being prosecuted? And, and I can say they knew or should have known. That's the term. If they didn't know, then they're incompetent. And I just don't believe they didn't know. As simple as that. Gertler was their gatekeeper. They had no business interest at all in DRC without Gertler. So please tell me how the top of the company that made billions, in his own personal case, $9.1 billion, didn't know about that. Was he asleep at the wheel? Was he on holiday? I, I'm sorry, that's just literally the farcical situation we get to. So I actually think if we really want to make a difference, people like Mr. Glazenberg, who run companies like that, have to suffer a serious penalty. And whether that's all his assets going, or he and other top executives have their collars felt, as the expression goes, and pay some personal liberty consequence, we will not change anything. There, as you said, there aren't enough cases, and the consequences simply are a matter of doing business. And if we don't change that, well, we're just going to talk forever about more cases, I think. And I just want to also add that, yes, I completely agree that um, they should, we should find a way where the company, the benefit from the company should also go to the people. That we must explore a way so that the issue of 
benefit and the damage. For example, in Nigeria, the companies now are now moving out. Who takes responsibility of the liability? They go with the profit, but they leave behind the liability. That's a really good issue. And I completely agree with you that um, money should not go to dictator's hand. And that's why we are also exploring alternative uh, on how the money should go to support the country without not necessarily going to the country hand. But like what Great said, the current legal framework that is available for sovereign government to discuss around this issue is UNCAC. And UNCAC, unfortunately, does not provide opportunity for no state actors to be the one to receive such money. And uh, as he said, it's also restricted to just totally money, not bribery and foreign bribery and all that. So those are conversations that we need to continue to raise as we continue this conversation. A couple of, of points on that. Um, so in Switzerland, the problem is that there's no class action possible, so there's no victim in the case of Gunvor. So no civil society can you know, uh, claim that money. Uh, so it's a political uh, avenue only, and so we're working with, with 30, 31 uh, civil society organizations in Switzerland sent a letter to the government of Switzerland asking for those 90 million to be redistributed. There's also a parliamentary initiative in Switzerland to look at all fines in the future to be redistributed. Um, so there's those 90 million we talked. There's 3 million uh, of créances compensatrices that are sitting in the Swiss banks as well for uh, SBM Offshore, which is this company that was convicted for cases in different countries, including 3 million in Nigeria that's also sitting in, in the banks. And um, the re redistribution is problematic because not only there's a problem with the, I mean, having the law in the case of, again, Gunvor, the, um, the governments of Congo and Cote d'Ivoire did not cooperate with the Swiss system, so that's the only case at the moment where the money could go back to the government. Um, so they say, well, there's no victim, the government didn't cooperate, so we can't give the money back. Um, uh, one way, one avenue is using civil society. Switzerland has done it in case of Siemens and Alstom, two companies convicted, and then some of the, some of the money went to civil society <coughs> in Switzerland and in Germany, so it's possible. But again, it was reparation, so it was slightly of a different legal procedure. So. Uh, again, it, Gunvor doesn't fit in that. So there's, yeah, different loopholes. And um, but civil society should be a one avenue. And uh, all this money could be used to bump up the justice system uh, budget, for example, to have more prosecutors to, to look into that. So there's um, uh, different, yeah, different loopholes in the law and in practice that makes it the situation now. And the government says, well, we don't want to give the money back so far, but we're trying to push for that. And finally, just on the gun war after 2011, well, they got um, the justice system basically made a perquisition in their office in 2012. So, right, so that's why, and then the, 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 the trader was uh, sacked in 2012. So that's where the situation in Congo stopped. It made some news back then, obviously, enough for, yeah, gun war to stop business in Congo, but not in Ecuador. And that's why they're in, in the problems now. So just to answer that specific question. Uh, there's a few more. Yeah, hands. I think we've got time for one more round of questions. People have time. Hi, um, my name is Catherine Anderson. I'm from the OECD. I work in the area of governance, um, anti corruption, and illicit finance <coughs> in the Development Assistance Committee. Fantastic session, and I mean, I can't applaud you enough for actually putting this to film because, you know, we really need all of these different kinds of devices to try and make the issue more real and more tangible for the average person, for, for citizens, you know, and for policymakers as well, because it's an incredibly complex and opaque field. Now, coincidentally, we have been working in the OECD for the last three or four years on exactly this issue, and uh, with uh, support from a number of partners, actually, member states, and there are a couple of things that um, we've observed, so I just want to make a, a sort of couple of observations on this. I mean, one is individual liability. Absolutely, of course, that side of things is important. That's going to deal with some of the transactional um, occurrences, if you like. But this is a systems issue, okay? And, and there are a number of global trends that have really affected that. Our research has shown, and I will unapologetically promote a, a study that we've, we've recently published on this point that you can find on our website. 
Um, and it's shown that the global financial crisis has seen the retreat of the big banks from physical commodities, and it was precisely that juncture that has enabled these independent traders to, to really rise in the way that they have. So they've become these meteoric, meteoric forces sort of following the GFC. They are unregulated. There is one that's publicly listed, that's Glencore. All of the rest of them are not. Those are the large independent traders. There are integrated energy firms, smaller mid-sized traders, and of course national oil companies, some of whom, like Sun and Gold, do their own sort of trading. So we can't treat them all the same way. They're all different. The big independents, like the Gunvors and the Glencores, are really where some of these challenges lie. So global financial crisis has enabled their rise, and I can tell you there's another punctuating event on the horizon, and that is the fact that there are now um, penalties and... and um, fines that are being levied across the banks if they get involved in brown industries in oil and gas activities. So the incentives for these traders to be doing more in this field and to be financing the energy transition is very, very high. The other aspect of our work is that we took a deep dive into the ownership, equity and accounting arrangements of these entities. And it's exactly as Gretel said. In fact, what we identified is they may have their corporate head in Switzerland, but, it, but they are widely dispersed across multiple jurisdictions. And there is a shift to the east. Mm. So the Dubais, the Singapores, yeah. you know, and elsewhere, which mm -hmm. makes them even more out of reach. Now, all of this sort of um, points to the fact, and, and, and I can say, Gretel, I would have to dispute the, you know, let's not have them do business necessarily in this area because our evidence is showing that it will be China and Russia that will step into the breach, in fact. So we actually really need to engage them, and we actually really need to ideally bring back the big banks, whatever their faults, because they do bring risk management and due diligence requirements, and they are much more easy, easily able to be sort of managed and, and, and engaged, if you like. But I mean, one of the big challenges, you go after the individual, but the, the step, systemic side of this is really important. So our work is looking particularly at development cooperation and what ODA can do to help the likes of Congo, Nigeria, and elsewhere. And, and we're saying we need to get back involved with the national oil companies as donors, provide risk management support, you know, help them make more informed decisions around how they're engaging in different kinds of deals. We need to leverage the role of the IMF their Article 4 surveillance. They don't do any kind of surveillance on IFF activities at the moment, when they could be across jurisdictions. Absolutely important is to be financing investigative journalism. I mean, as an accountability tool, this has been such a hugely valuable instrument in the commodity trading space. The Bian Maliki case in, in France, activities that have happened in Switzerland and elsewhere. So that is a real channel of that sort of accountability. And then, of course, we need to be looking at corporate governance, state-owned enterprise integrity, responsible business conduct, and connecting all of those dots. So sort of in our roles, the, I, I think the, the, the largest message coming out is to say, look, let's try and work across all of those different multidisciplinary domains. The fact that we even had two sessions on this issue so we had a set out, you can see our recorded panel, we had a panel discussion on this on Thursday, and now there's this film. I mean, it's really getting some visibility, but it's not a, it's not a um, case of small fish. All of these corporate entities, that, that may have been 85 million in that case, but the returns for these companies, they are clocking 260 billion a year in revenues for you know, the likes of Glencore. Mm -hmm. or uh, sort of 200, 260 for Gunvor in the 2019-2021. Yeah. So, so just to say, you know, hugely appreciative of, of all of this. I think that we need to have those connections across all of the different domains. And... Uh, very much. I'm sorry, we're just running Thank out you. of time. And while I'm just moving over here, just I know that Roland's very keen for the film to be seen by lots of different people. So if you have an audience or a community that you're working with where you think this film might be useful, do get in touch with Roland. There was a question at the back. Hi. Uh, Thank you very much uh, for the insightful, really insightful and powerful movie and the insightful uh, discussion. I'm Matthias Huter with the UNCAC Coalition. I just had... Um, a question about how can we get, what are, are there, do you see any policy, policy fixes to bring more cases? We've heard about the under-resourced prosecutors and, and oversight bodies, something we see everywhere. Um, do you see any, any mechanisms that would allow us to hold more companies and actors to account? Like the, um, so you focused on putting CEOs into prison, which is, I think, a legitimate uh, angle. But in the US, we have all these settlements uh, that, that result in financial penalties for, for companies 
nobody goes to jail, but more and more cases can be done quicker with fewer resources through that. And we have, for example, in the US, the, the, incent the financial incentives for whistleblowers. So people have an, a financial incentive to come forward to report wrongdoing. Are these, or, or in France, we, we see many cases resulting because civil society has the legal standing to bring cases uh, and get governments to investigate. Do you see any, any solutions? Do we need a mix of solutions? Um, or is that the, the wrong avenue and we just need more resources and better reg regulation? Thank you. I think, sure, I think maybe uh, there's a one final question here or anyone? One final question? No? All right. Is that no? Um, on the, um, I think there's no civil bullet, but definitely the role of civil society. I mean, in Switzerland, they're actually trying to bring that possibility of class action together, like, so it could be done like in the US or in France. So they're working on that, but yeah, uh, this film would have been, would not have been possible without the work of Public Eye, which is one of the lead, leading organizations in Switzerland looking at the work of Swiss companies abroad. Um, so funding those, com those um, uh, NGOs, civil society organization is key. And also, um, yeah, a journalist in general. I think that's really, really important. Um, yeah. Final comments. Final comments. Mm -hmm. I, I have three things to say. Um, one is, uh, in terms of trying to keep these companies uh, operational, this is why we've got uh, traders now as part of EITI. But I would, I, I would put up there that EITI is a weak institution. We are constantly fighting to improve it. It is far better than it was, but it's not good enough. And so, you know, there's an aspiration. Last, let's see where we can pull it. That's one thing. Um, there was a third thing. I can't remember what that was. But in answer to your question about are we getting better, I, I, I find the whole idea of settlements, frankly, quite frustrating. I, I, I don't see a, a drop in the cases. I just see a, a, a tax take. And it, you know, the, the settlement money doesn't go back to the victim state. Oh, I know what my third thing was. My third thing was that I think we need to see where we have repatriation of funds, civil society, first of all, overseeing where the money goes, because that can give the guarantee to the institution repatriating them that it's not just disappearing down another kleptocratic hole. That's great. In the, in the victim country and, the, and in the subsequent recipient end. But at the same time, I think we need to see civil society monitoring the institutions that repetitively take the money because their due diligence processes are simply not good enough. And that we don't see. And when we look, talk to, we've talked to some authorities about this and they're not interested. And so there's, a, there's an inequality, I think, in thinking here. And we're talking about serial offenders. You know, in all of this stuff, it takes two to tango. As someone beautifully yeah. said, I think it was Brees on the film, you know, our leaders are corrupt. Yeah, but who corrupts them, right? And that's the point, and the, the corrupting end is both the traders in this example and also oil companies or whatever, but it's also the banks that take the loot, and they do it over and over again. And they say, oh, we didn't know. Not good enough, not any longer. We've talked about this for 20 years. We need some action. Okay. Yeah, just to add that um, I completely agree with Simon, and I think the first thing is to continue to raise public awareness public's power. If you look at the public power, the people's power, movement will change the conversation, shift the power of conversation because um, the current framework for deciding and resolving some of these cases uh, relies on existing legal framework. And references are made to EITI as one possible solution. But you can hear from Simon now um, the weakness of EITI is even obvious in Nigeria. Uh, it's very clear that EITI can't solve any of this problem in Nigeria. And so the question that uh, Matthias raised about what kind of tools that are available out there that we can use I feel very strongly that the first thing is to build a movement, is to raise an awareness. And thus, there's a role for journalists, there's a role for civil society. This kind of theme is 
really show clearly how journalists and NGOs can work together mm -hmm. to provide life to some of this conversation. And that will build the momentum. And then before you know, and some of the tools that are available now uh, can be very used properly to unpack this issue. And again, um, I also want to put lastly, we must amplify the voice of the victim. Uh, is missing in the whole conversation. And we, we must look for a way for their testimony to be the driving force. It will help sustain the struggle. Thank you. I think that's a good place to end, unless you want to make any final comment, Roland. So just please, can we say thank you to the panelists, and in particular, thank you to Roland for the film. And thank you to you for coming.